okay, you can start paddling. Okay, so welcome everyone. I'd like to welcome uh, those attending with us on the Zoom uh, and also those watching us on the YouTube, uh, on the YouTube channel. Uh, I'll start with an Arabic, with an announcement in Arabic first, and then switch back to English, the language in which the rest of the discussion will uh, continue. So, Alan Bikum Gamian, I would do Tarheed Bir Hadrin Mana, Ala Al Zoom, or like Aladina Shahiduna, Ala Kanat YouTube. I would do Tanwih Bidayatan, Ilana Logat Hada Lika, Sofa Takun here. الإنجليزية اللغة الأساسية للقاء الإنجليزية إلا أن ملتقى يتيح ترجمة فورية يمكن للحاضرين على زوم اختيار هذه الترجمة إذا كانوا يريدون الاستماع للقاء بالعربية أسفل الشاشة ستجدون علامة كرة أو كرة أرضية وكلمة interpretation عند الضغط على هذا الزر سوف تستمرون في اللقاء مع الاستماع للترجمة الفورية بالعربية أما بالنسبة, بالنسبة لمن يشاهدوننا على يوتيوب فسوف يكون اللقاء مذاعا بالإنجليزية فقط ويتيح الملتقى ترجمة للقاء كاملا وسوف تكون متاحة بعد انتهاء اللقاء بحوالي ساعة وسوف ترسل إليكم عبر بريد الإلكتروني فلنبدأ اللقاء So uh, again, I want to welcome everyone uh, so this is the fourth panel discussion organized by Law for Palestine. Uh, I was just announcing that the main language of the discussion will be uh, uh, in English. And there is instant interpretation. So I'd also like uh, to ask all uh, English speakers uh, to speak uh, clearly and slowly so that they give time to our interpreters. Uh, so yeah. So I'm moderating this discussion. My name is Abdel Ghani Sayed. Uh, I'm a lawyer practicing law in Egypt and uh, currently a PhD student at uh, Kent University. Uh, so yeah, so today's uh, discussion is really about uh, international law and it's about what is international law and what does it serve? Uh, is international law a tool in the hands of the powerful? and a tool for uh, the subjugation of the weak? Uh, or rather, can it serve uh, an, uh, an emancipatory potential? Uh, one of the most important uh, uh, books in this area when it comes to Palestine uh, has been published two years ago uh, by our host, uh, by, uh, by our guest today, sorry, Dr. Noura Arakat, and it's called Justice for Some, uh, Law and the Question of Palestine. Uh, so uh, Dr. Noura Araqat uh, is an international uh, Palestinian American human rights attorney and assistant professor at Rutgers University and a non-resident visit, uh, visiting fellow at uh, Harvard University. Dr. Araqat is a co-founding editor of Jadaliya Electronic Magazine and a policy advisor to Al Shabaka. She has also served as a legal counsel to a subcommittee at the US House of Representatives and as a Middle East consultant to one of the members of the Congress. Uh, in her latest book, Justice for Some, Dr. Arakat discussed at length uh, the issue of uh, Palestine and international law and how international law can serve an emancipatory potential. Uh, it is actually very relevant, especially those days after the latest decision by the pre-chamber uh, uh, of the of the um, of the international criminal court uh, so in this context one can ask uh, is it worth it after uh, a long time of palestinian legal strategies uh, now we have a pre-trial chamber uh, decision uh, to begin an investigation to consider palestine a state for the purpose of the rome statute to begin an investigation and to begin an investigation in palestine uh, so one of the questions will be related to the ICC decision and also many other uh, events that happened that make us question whether international law uh, uh, is a tool for emancipation or rather a tool for subjugation of Palestinians. Uh, 
so the floor is, is yours, Dr. Noura. شكرا عبد الغاني شكرا حسان شكرا لكم كلكم بدي اهنيكم على هاي المبادره اللي هي المؤسسه Law for Palestine القانون باجل فلسطين وبدي اعتذر منكم انه يا ريت بقدر امارس انا هذا الحوار كله واللقاء بالعربي اللي اصلا لما اسمعك عم تحكي عبد الغاني كانك عم بتغني الصراحه احسن احلى كثير من الانجليزي اللي هي لغه الاستعمار <تصفيق> والعنف بس للاسف الشديد المصطلحات اللي بدي بدي اياها انه اتحدث عن القانون والسياسه والقانون الدولي ما بقدر الا بالانجليزي فشكرا لكم وبعتذر وان شاء الله بالمستقبل اقدر امارس نفس الحديث معكم بالعربي um, so now switching over um, I, I just wanna, um, you know, jump right in. I think that the question that you ask is one that I asked myself, which is what is what is the potential of international law in leveraging um, emancipatory struggles and extending them? And I think that, the, you know, that is the that is precisely what I set out to answer in the book. That is precisely what I set out to answer in my own journey as a human rights attorney and an advocate. Um, I want to be really clear that the book is not merely an intellectual exercise, but is one that was ba- has been based on practice, practice in the field. And that my desire to answer this question was not an intellectual theoretical quandary that I found myself exploring in the text, but instead one that I found in the actual field. Um, I am trained firstly and foremostly as an organizer. Um, I was a student organizer. I was also uh, at the same time, I'm an organizer with communities in the San Francisco Bay Area when we were organizing against the sanctions in Iraq. Um, I was an organizer when I was on the UC Berkeley campus and we launched the first divestment campaign in February 2001 when Ariel Sharon was elected into office for a second time. Um, um, and, and so, and this was also in the context of what we know as the second intifada, it was the, fr- my frustration with the inability to change the circumstances on the ground through that political activism that then led me to continue my education in law. Um, and very much as anybody would imagine, my faith in the law was that somehow, somehow, it would offer a more level and fair playing field based on evidence, argumentation, jurisprudence, precedent, analogy, right? That there was this uh, this faith in a place that might be uh, shielded from the politics that made it impossible to change power through our protest, or so I thought. Um, And so that was the journey that led me to law school. Um, And even after law school, though, I kept balancing um, organizing and legal advocacy as I, I, you know, upon graduation, um, continued to plant uh, BDS campaigns. This is in 2005. So, you know, this is (laughs) some 16 years ago. We've been doing this work, um, but we were planting BDS campaigns across university campuses and churches. Uh, we were, you know, I was going to obscure communities to share, you know, the discussion about why we should divest from Caterpillar D9 and D10 bulldozers that ultimately crushed Rachel Corey in the Gaza Strip uh, to death. I mean, it was in that context that we were, you know, we were working with the Methodist church, the Presbyterian church to divest their holdings. And at the same time, I was working with teams of attorneys to sue. I wanted, this was my dream. I wanted to sue Israeli generals. I mean, I, and this, I want to emphasize this because I can't, if I, if I can show you my email inbox, okay, or my Facebook messengers or my, or, you know, my Twitter, all of it is filled with inquiry. How do I sue to get my land back? How do I sue for the torture of, of, of my family member? How do I sue for the killing of my child? 
right? And now this is very personal because it's my family asking me, how do they sue Israel for the assassination of their son and my cousin, Ahmed Ariqat, who was shot to death on video, point blank, six times above the waist, be completely unarmed with his hands raised above his head. And there's been no investigation. And there is deep frustration. How do we use the law to stop Israel and to hold it to account? And it's the same question, obviously, that undergirds the excitement around the possibility of the ICC, um, jur you know, jurisdiction and prosecution, investigation. And I'm happy. I'm, I'm going to get into it. And then, obviously, I'm sure people want to ask about that. And happy to get into it even more through the Q and A. But just to emphasize that it's that same frustration and drive that has led me um, in my professional career to dedicate myself to this work, to go to law school, um, and then to sue Israeli generals and officials. We sued two in 2000, um, and, and it was 2006, we sued two Israeli officials. One was Avi Dichter, who was the commander, Israeli commander of, um, of the army in the Gaza Strip in 2005 when they raised 5,000 homes in Rafah as part of a military operation. Um, and we also sued Moshe Alon, who was uh, responsible for the bombing of a uniful compound in southern Lebanon in Qana um, in 2006 that um, you know, has been well documented by Robert Fisk, may he rest in power, and others that demonstrates that they knew that this was a UN building offering shelter, and yet they targeted it anyway, right? It was, so it would be willful killing. Yeah. Oh, sorry, could you please um, slow down a little bit? Okay. <laughs> yes, sure. sorry. يمكن كان أحسن إذا حكيت بالعربي لأنه أكيد ما فيني أحكي هالقد بسرعة بالعربي. So it was the point is is that we sued two Israeli generals um, for their crimes, what we considered war crimes, and could art could be tantamount to crimes against humanity in the Gaza Strip and in Lebanon. Um, and within less than a year. Both federal courts in the DC District Court as well as in the Southern District of New York, which are federal US courts, dismiss the cases for a lack of justiciability, which means that they did not have the jurisdiction to arbitrate the question. That another, you know, either they decided that another branch of US government was better suited to adjudicate this issue, or they decided that. You cannot, you know, suing these uh, officials was tantamount to suing the state of Israel, and you cannot sue a foreign state unless there's an exception, and there is no exception in the U.S. to suing Israel. So here we are, you know, here's a, my, you know, my lifetime so far, my young lifetime, dedicated, wanting to pursue these lawsuits, waiting for the opportunity. Now we have two Israeli officials in the U.S. We serve them both with process. We go to court, the claims are, the actual motions that were submitted are outstanding, meticulously researched, absolutely impeccable legal arguments. And they never got a hearing because the US federal courts decided they don't have the capacity and the jurisdiction to hear the questions. Now, obviously this was disappointing, but as somebody who didn't wanna give up, I did what my mentor at the time, Susan Akram, who is an esteemed professor at Boston University. She runs a clinic on refugee law and is an expert on refugee law. I encourage you to invite her um, onto your program. She advised me to study other jurisdictions in the United States in order to just, you know, find a more favorable panel of judges. Right? Because this also comes down to, it depends on who heard your case. So in the course of doing that research to find a more favorable jurisdiction, I discovered something else. I discovered that if you control for the identity of the claimants as Arabs or Palestinians, right? And if you control for the identity of the defendants who are Israelis, that if you control for those variables, the same 
issues that the federal court said were non-justiciable in our case were actually not hurdles in cases involving China, Papua New Guinea, Guatemala, the Philippines, Paraguay, Liberia, and so on and so forth. So what, what, I, what ended up happening is rather than developing a legal strategy, I actually published my first academic article demonstrating bias, that there was bias here and planted you know, the seed that I had been confronting, which is what is the relationship with law and politics that's producing this outcome? Right. And I continue to engage in this question as I continue my legal advocacy, as you mentioned, I, I worked on the Hill to examine power from the inside. I was young and I and I, you know, this is part of my education. I, I, I worked at the UN on behalf of a Palestinian um, NGO, the Badil Refugee and Residency Rights Center based in Bethlehem, which is excellent. I encourage you. They have been at the forefront of creating this legal analysis and advocacy. Um, I, you know, worked on their, I represented them at the UN General Assembly to lobby the Security Council members to actually enforce the findings and recommendations of the Goldstone Report in the aftermath of the bombing of Gaza. I traveled with a legal team to Gaza in 2009 in order to investigate these war crimes. All of, and so on and so forth, all of this to share that I continue trying to pursue a line of advocacy, right? Thinking that there was a way to overcome the hurdles, the political hurdles I had confronted in the organizing sphere, only to find that the law was not shielded from these political balances of power and these political questions. And this, you know, the inquiries and the writing and the study and the advocacy is what actually you know, motivated me to go back to school to answer this question. The easiest way, right, before I even began, you know, this inquiry, and I'm sure everybody on the surface level can give a very obvious answer. The very obvious answer is that law is power, which is not untrue, right? You know, but some people go so far, and I've heard this from many, many Palestinians especially, that like that the law is not just power the law only serves the powerful also not untrue the problem with ending the inquiry there right is that it is an apology for power and it's admitting that we are participating in some political fiction masked in the liberal clothing of legality and jurisprudence. And that was unsatisfying, right? It's the same way as any forms of power are not absolute. Even if it's military power, Israel is the only nuclear power in the Middle East and the 11th most powerful military in the world. The, um, is the US's empire's primary ally proclaimed ally in the Middle East. And yet, even Israel's military power is not absolute, as has been confronted by um, non-conventional or irregular combatants uh, from the Arab world. We've seen that historically, right? Economic power is not absolute, as we've seen in the response to grassroots um, economic um, a, a political activism like BDS. There is no power that's absolute. And that was what my, my dissatisfaction with what I thought was an easy answer. I could have answered that question without doing any, without any reading. I can look at the UN Security Council. It's comprised of 15 members. Five of the members are permanent and have veto power. Those five have vetoed any, any initiative that seeks to hold themselves or any of their allies to account. Okay, that's the end of the story. There's no international accountability. All of this to say is I understand all of this. I understood it before I began the inquiry and found it unsatisfying because I think that power is more complex than that. And that complexity is precisely the reason that people have been able to prevail against colonial domination 
against imperialism, against dictatorships. With that in mind, I then began to examine the other side of, you know, kind of legality and, and understanding it. And there's a positivist school of thought. The positive is if, if these realists are, are one extreme who believe that law is power and that's the end of the story and it's just a political fiction, there's another extreme that believes that law is scientific and we can study it on its own outside of a, um, you know, the context in which it, it emerges to under, you know, as long as we study the core meaning, for those of you who study law, as long as we study the core meaning and we take into account the penumbra and then we consider the drafting history and we under, you, then, and the legislative, you know, um, purpose of, of the law, then we can produce an outcome of the law and what it means that it has some true meaning that is immune from a political, historical, economic context. And I think that that, frankly, is, is just not true. I would go so far as to say it's, almost, it's naive based upon the fact that the law has not produced that outcome, that the law has not been immune from, from, from these contexts. And so to settle this, you know, to settle this inquiry, I, I draw on Duncan Kennedy's um, work uh, on his theory of legal work, which argues that there is no actual meaning for the law and that the meaning and, and that it's subject, right? It's subject to legal contest between the lawyers, which means what evidence you use what drafting history, whose legislative motive do you emphasize? What empirical documents become enter, are relevant to enter into the record? What jurisdiction, right? All of these legal strategies that are then subject to the interpretation of the judge who has the ultimate say in determining which, um, which approach was actually more apt. And then a third step which is the application itself. So even if you do find a meaning for the law after this contentious process, it still needs to be applied in practice. All of that matters, all of that matters. And so I conclude, you know, I, if, if these were the two extremes, the realists and the positivists, I, I'm not in the middle even, I'm very close to the realists, but not so far as to say that law, that it lacks complexity. I conclude and say, that yes, law is power. Yes, law is power. And in order to be leveraged in the service of an emancipatory struggle, it must be wielded in the sophisticated service of political movement. What does that mean? That the law itself can have the same text, unchanging text, and yet change significance and meaning over time. And the reason for that is because of the political historical context, the balance of military power, the balance of moral authority, the balance of economic power, an international context that gives these texts meaning. So I use an analogy, which is to think of the law like the sail of a boat. You cannot move um, in a boat unless you have a sail. But even if you have the sail, you don't know what direction you're going to move in because that depends on the wind. The law is the sail of the boat and the wind is the direction of the political movement. So keep the sail up if the wind is blowing in your direction, draw the sail if the wind is against you and create a new sail when possible. Which is, you know, I know for a lot of um, positive lawyers would think that what I'm saying is slanderous, right? What? You want to manipulate the law? And my response is, the, there is no true meaning of the law for us to be faithful to it. But I also don't conclude to throw it away um, because it is a reality and we should use it as a tool. How we use it as a tool and how effective it could be for our purposes doesn't depend 
on the brilliance of lawyers. It depends on the political context and what is happening. So I bear out this argument in the book over a century. I start from 1917 and I ended in 2017. And rather than get into the nitty gritty of jurisprudence and cases, and I tell a much bigger story about how the law has changed, actually what we understand over time. Um, and so start you know, in the Balfour Declaration, which begins with a colonial erasure of Palestinians as a people. They no longer become a people and now they're a bunch of Arabs who happen to be in the region. There were refu refugees in need of humanitarian service until 1967. Well, specifically, actually, until 1968, when uh, the militant factions of Palestinian factions take over the PLO. The second chapter looks um, at the, the 1967 war and demonstrates how Israel has been able to expand and entrench its um, um, settlement enterprise, not in spite of international law, but because of international law. It's precisely the occupation law framework and Israel's ability to manipulate that framework that makes its presence in the occupied territories legal. We can discuss that. You can ask me questions. I'm just going to give you the overview. And then the third chapter is basically the height of Palestinian ad legal advocacy when the PLO enters the United Nations in 1974, establishes the juridical status of the Palestinian people, establishes that, you know, creates a corrective to 242, which was a, as we know, 242 was rejected by the PLO for 20 years as a tool of defeat. It basically legitimized Israel's existence without recognizing the Palestinian right to self-determination. It affirmed the erasure of Palestinians. Well, the PLO created a corrective to that in 1974 in resolution 3236, and probably most significantly it did two things, which was to establish that Zionism, Zionism, Kurtzelian Zionism in particular, um, was racism, not merely racial discrimination, but racist which was very controversial. Um, and I'm happy, um, should I stop? I see the translation has ended. Yeah, we can, uh, we can uh, continue in the, in the Q and A session, Q and A session, yeah. Should I continue this, my, my remarks? Uh, just a minute, okay. I, don't know if my, I don't know if my voice is here, just a minute, because I'm having some technical issue with the headphones that I'm, you know, I'm, I'm listening to you from the, sorry sorry for interrupting uh, i think uh, nora can go ahead Abdelani, if you let me just to to um yeah uh, there was a problem just with the uh, uh, interpretation now it is uh, it's solved, so uh, you can go ahead, uh, uh, Nora. Okay. Um, let me sum up so we can get to the Q&A, but I got to the juncture where the Palestinian legal advocacy was the most effective when the PLO declared Zionism as a form of racism in 1975, and most significantly, and here's where Palestinians, remember when I said create a new sale? The PLO created sales in the 1970s. Resolution 3236, as an alternative to Resolution 242 was a sale. Zionism as racism was a sale, right? Um, and then in 1977, together with the non-aligned movement, the, 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 the national liberation armies and newly independent states created laws of war that recognized guerrillas as soldiers. So what had been previously declared as criminals and terrorists now become recognized in the language of law as legitimate combatants who have the right to fight. They have the right to kill. They can be killed. If they are captured, they are prisoners of war. They are- 
سو جنائي حرب الصوتيه بدي دخل عليك اه, آه. يبدو صوت الترجمه دخل على صوت المتحدث اكمل افترض آه افترض ان اكون في تشامبر مختلف عنك انا يا ثواني يا نوره معلش نشوف بس هاي الاشكاليه في راحتكم انا متاسكه نو no ويز حسان ممكن تحكي هلا اوكي أه حسان يس أه تمام جو اهيد نورا ام سو حسان يو ار ترانسليتنج ذا بارت وير اي سيد اف ذي ار كابتشرد ذي ويل بي تريتد از بريزنرز اوف وور تو بي اكسشينجد فور اذر بريزنرز ان ذا افتر ماث My point here is that Palestinians were able to establish that their fighters had the right to fight. They created that law and the additional protocols, the Geneva Conventions, Protocols 1 and 2 passed in 1977. Um, now, the background to the story is that the PLO was less concerned about um, these battles and using the law as an alternative. There's, a, there's divisions within the PLO at the time Um, and that they were interested primarily in entering a direct sphere of contact with the United States and as a party in the Middle East peace process. They resolved that in what I discussed in the fourth chapter, which is Oslo. And in, Os uh, in discussing Oslo, initially I thought I would translate, use my legal analysis to translate the documents into, you know, to explain it to people to understand, right? I would use water as an example in its distribution. Instead, I thought after reading the documents cover to cover that you don't need to be a lawyer to understand the documents. You need to be literate. They are very obvious in how unfair they are to Palestinians. Not once do they even mention that a Palestine state will be established. Not once. In fact, They are verbatim, almost verbatim, the language that Anwar al-Sadat and um, Menachem Begin uh, uh, established in 1978, which led to the Camp David Accords and the permanent peace treaty between Egypt and Israel in 1979. In 1978, Palestinians rejected these terms of autonomy um, and derivative sovereignty, right? Permanent ghettos. But in 1993, we were celebrating this as a major victory. So instead, I answered the question of how, right? How did Israel manage this achievement? And why did the PLO agree to it? You can ask me what, what the answer to that is, but I want to move forward and say that then in the final chapter, I basically look at Israel's wars in the Gaza Strip primarily between Uh, but not in the Gaza Strip, the wars against Palestinians. When Israel changes its, its relationship to Palestinians from an occupying power to an, a, a belligerent adversary, right? Um, Hassan, I don't, um, to an adversary in war, right? That where the Palestinians can be shot to kill, which is a different level of violence that's permitted than under a framework of occupation law. In occupation law, you can only use police power because you are usurping that authority from the occupied people. Um, and you need to use that police power in order to maintain law and order until you can revert to a status quo ante. And instead here we see Israel using military force, shooting to kill. We saw that grotesquely at first in the West Bank in the form of assassinations in the course of that second Palestinian Intifada And then we see it come to full bloom. The legal analysis that Israel uses there, we see it come to full bloom in the successive attacks on Gaza between 2004 and 2014. Um, and obviously after the book, it continued when 
um, in, in the use of force against the Gaza March of Return, where 30 to 40,000 Palestinians were marching to the perimeter in the largest civil society action that the world has seen. And yet even then, the Israeli army was using snipers and shot above, you know, over 95% of Palestinians above the waist, in the neck, in the head, in the back, and defending it. And so in fact, the reason I was saying was because after the book, I actually wrote about that, that legal decision and that jurisprudence of what leads Israel to do this. And because of um, Salah's incredible legal work, documentation and advocacy, I was able to make the argument of what was to document what was happening in Gaza to make to bear out this point. That's that's kind of the overview of the book. And if if it, you know, the, the takeaway from it is that over the course of a hundred years, the law has done more to advance Israel's territorial settler ter settler colonial interests, which includes territory, more territory and less Palestinians over the hundred years than it has been to advance Palestinian interests. It has done more for Israel than it has done for us, which seems really ironic when you listen to the news and you hear, you know, the uh, Israel and the US condemning the ICC, condemning the Human Rights Council, condemning the ICE International Court of Justice, condemning any UNESCO, any body that advocates for Palestinian that they describe as lawfare. And they're saying, and, and which is ironic because it seems like it's doing more for us, but it's actually doing more for Israel on the ground in terms of changing the terms. And yet part of Israel and the US's strategy is to delegitimize the law when it's used by Palestinians and by their advocates. It's part of their political work to apply a particular meaning. And now the meaning that they wanna apply is to make any criticism of Israel and certainly any form of anti-Zionism as tantamount to anti-Semitism. And they're doing that effectively. Okay, so that I'm not gonna tell you about my political, you know, there's what I think in terms of the future, the, the short of it is, I think it's, it's um, that I think that the future, we need to think really radically, have a radical imagination, thinking beyond political solutions, beyond binationalism, one state, two state, those, uh, those were uh, available to the UN Special Committee on Palestine in 1947, okay? I don't think that it's those political ideas that we're lacking about how we can organize ourselves. Um, what I do in the conclusion of the book is to start to ask ourselves different questions, not about what the political solution is, but instead about how do we change the conditions, right? Um, that can produce an outcome, which means I draw on indigenous literature and Afrofuturist literature to think about a radical future and then work backwards. And in that way, the basic thing that I, I do in the conclusion is to ask the audience to not conceive of the return of Palestinian refugees as our victory and the culmination of our struggle, but instead to begin there as the beginning of our struggle. Once Palestinians have refugees have returned, now what? How do we organize ourselves? How do we treat other refugees, not Palestinians? How do we deal with the land? Do we still privatize the land or does it become available for common use? Who and what is Palestinian? Where do Jews fit in our society? What does decolonization look like for them? How do we offer the Jews who remain because we always say we don't mind that Jews are in Palestine. We just do not want them to be our masters. So now if they stay, what it, how do we imagine their, their role? What is a future we can offer them that is better than the future Israel offers them? So I, I end with a lot of provocation rather than thinking of solutions and blueprints. We have to think of, of us, of organizing ourselves, which is very difficult because we have a boot on our neck. So how do you imagine with, if you can't breathe? Um, and and, and that, that's very difficult. 
And I admit that. And I know that my role in the academy gives me that privilege. But it is, you know, it's where I think that if to the extent that we can have those thoughts, the extent that we can think radically, what does it look like then? Um, what? Okay, so going back to the law question, um, what does that mean about what we should do with the law? I, I think that we should use it, obviously. I think that we should use it, but I think that we should be much smarter than we have been. I think that part of the reason that the you know Palestinians were effective in using it in the 1970s because of the context at the time of a third world upheaval. I think um, since then, the Palestinian leadership and you know especially the official leadership has used the law almost as a threat and a tool, but has not used it strategically. Even uh, um, and I can discuss all of the opportunities we've had. So many opportunities to use it strategically, whether it was Goldstone, right? Whether it's been the, the commission of inquiry of, on the settlements, whether it's been the general, you know, the UN bid for statehood, whether it's been the opportunity to oust Israel from FIFA, right? All these opportunities where we have had the law available to us and we've just, I don't think that the leadership has, has engaged with it in a strategic way um, and instead continues to use it either haphazardly, right? Or uses it as a threat. If you don't agree to these terms, we will take you to court, but has not taken it seriously as a political playing field, as an other side of battle for us. Um, and that's most evidenced in the ICC bid. The ICC bid, um, the Palestinian leadership has left it to the court to make these decisions when the real outcome, and I'll get into this in the q and I'm sure, so I'll just say my critique without my reasoning, justification for the critique. Um, the Palestinians, we're not gonna get a legal victory. We're not going to win the legal victory we think we're going to win. Netanyahu will not be on the stand. And the Palestinian leadership needs to explain this to Palestinians. That's not, but, that doesn't mean that this opportunity is not important and that it doesn't af afford for us an opportunity to win this battle in the court of public opinion. Let us use the controversy over ICC jurisdiction and the back and forth to mobilize public opinion, to enter, to write op-eds, to engage in televised debates, to have bear out these questions for the people, to allow the survivors of mass atrocities of all Palestinians to have a chance to tell their stories to the world. That's what we should be using this ICC bid for, in my opinion, which is to use it as an opportunity rather than to wait for the court to give us an outcome, which I promise you, as optimistic as I am, will be disappointing. We might win on some things, but we're gonna, and, and, and I've hosted panels on the ICC. I know the disappointment that comes once you get into the questions of law and the ICC um, jurisdiction, it becomes so legally elite. It be, the language even that we discuss within the court, even if you read what the 65 paged decision by the pretrial chamber, is of no relevance to the people. It's such, it's so, it's so dense legally, right? But the battle that we could win is the battle um, in the public opinion. And frankly, without that battle, the ICC as a political body is not going to have the support it needs in order to challenge the US and Israel. Fatou Ben Souda took Office of the Prosecutor, took five years to answer whether Palestine had jurisdictional standing, even after it acceded to the Rome Statute, which me, and it was voted as a state by the General Assembly in 2012. So in 2012, it's a state. In 2015, it's a party to the statute. It took five years for Fatou Bansouda to decide that Palestine has jurisdiction according to this. Then she sends it to the pretrial chamber, right? by a three panel judge, three panel court um, that decide the same thing and it takes them another year. 
She's about to leave in June. The new office, the new prosecutor is Karim Khan, who is, I think, um, Pakistani Muslim British barrister who has challenged ISIS, but is the top choice for Israel in the United States, which means now, this is the politics. Will he, just because they found jurisdiction doesn't mean they have to pursue an investigation. Just because they pursue an investigation doesn't mean it has to take, um, it will be done quickly. It took uh, the ICC over 12 years to investigate the um, torture at Bagram Detention Center in Afghanistan. This can drag out for another 12 years if they pursue the investigation. Then, once we're in it, now we're going to get into a lot of legal questions, which I'll spare you. I think that there could be some positive outcomes legally, but my point is I do not put my eggs in that basket. Instead, I think that there's a way that we can achieve this, that we should pursue this much more strategically that involves the politics of it, um, that allows us to win publicly, even if we lose in the court. So I'll end there. Thank you. Thank you, Nora. Thank you very much. Um, that has been very insightful. And uh, I, I personally enjoyed that very much. And I'm, uh, I mean, I, I liked a lot your book. I have it next to me here. I really okay. wish everybody reads that book. It's very important. Uh, and yeah, I'm very happy to hear you talk about that book. Uh, so, and I do have questions for you, but uh, let's first, uh, ask if uh, if uh, our participants have uh, questions. So first, uh, <clears throat> you can ask your question in Arabic, and in this case, I will provide uh, uh, a quick uh, uh, paraphrasing of your question. Um, but you can also ask your question in English, and in this case, the, our instant interpreters will provide the translation. Um, we'll take. Uh, rounds of questions, like three questions per round, I think, Nora, right? That's, you prefer that? Fine, yeah. So, uh, so yeah, please, if you have questions, uh, raise your hand or type your question in the chat. Okay, is a female تسأل السؤال بس لو مداخلة هيبقى عندنا مجال للمداخلات في آخر اللقاء لو سؤال تفضل يعني أنا بتسلم عن نورة بالأول يعني آه يعني صديقة عزيزة وأنا دائما يعني بسمع إلى باهتمام وبشكرها على هذه المداخلة المهمة جدا ولكن أنا يعني ليس سؤال بقدر ما هو أنني ألتقط مع كل ما جاءت فيه بأننا أمام للأسف الشديد أمام صراع يدور على قاعدة موازين قوة ولا يدور على قاعدة حق وباطل ولو كان الصراع يدور على قاعدة حق وباطل ربما لأخذنا حقوقنا كفلسطينيين منذ زمن بعيد كما أنني أود ألفت النظر إلى كل العقبات التي ذكرتها سواء بالمحكمة الجنايات بتسييس القانون نعم هي عقبات حقيقية وطريق العدالة الدولي ليس مفروش بالورود ولكنها أداة ولا يوجد شعب تحتل في العالم يعني حرر نفسه بقوة القانون الدولي القانون الدولي عامل مساعد وإنما هي مجموعة عوامل من بينها المقاومة الشعبية المقاومة المسلحة المقاومة الدبلوماسية إذا افترضنا أننا لدينا أيضا مشروع مقاوم أو استراتيجي نضالي للأسف يعني ما يعوز الفلسطينيين غياب الاستراتيجية لتدويل هذا الصراع واستخدام كل الأدوات أدوات الحماية المقاطعة المساءلة المحاسبة غيرها من أدوات حتى التعاقدية في الأمم المتحدة على بقراطيتها وعلى يعني طول الأمد التقاضي وطول هذه الإجراءات إضافة لنا نحتاج إلى رصد يعني موازنات لهذا العمل لأن هذا العمل يتطلب جهد كبير ويتطلب عمل شاق ويتطلب أيضا تعاون ويتطلب تكامل ما بين مؤسسات المجتمع المدني وأيضا يتطلب تكامل مع السلطة وأيضا مع حتى الفلسطينيين في كل مكان المهم ما ذكرتي باتجاه أنه إحنا نستفيد من الحد الأدنى الممكن والمتاح من آليات القانون الدولي والقانون الدولي الإنساني ولكن على قاعدة أن نعي تماما أن بمقدورنا أن يعني على الأقل أن هذه الأدوات يمكن استخدامها لقطع الطريق على مرامي الاحتلال في استخدامها بشكل أفضل منا إضافة إلى أيضا عمل كامبين مستمر لأن هذه المؤسسات تخضع إلى يعني تحتاج إلى مناصرة 
وضغط مستمر وتحتاج إلى تجنيد كل جهودنا من أجل الضغط على هذه المؤسسات لكي تقوم بالحد الأدنى المطلوب من دورها من جراء أيضا هناك ضغوط تمارس كما ترى إسرائيل كيف تمارس ضغوط على محكمة الجنايات كيف تمارس ضغوط على الأمم المتحدة كيف تلاحق أي مسؤول وبالتالي هذا بده جهد كبير في هذا المجال منا كفلسطينيين أنا واثق أنه عدالة قضيتنا مهمة ولكنها غير كافية إلا إذا حسمنا استخدام هذه الأدوات بالشكل المطلوب حتى نحقق يعني الفائد المرجوة أنا يعني بشكرك مرة أخرى كل التقدير لهذه المداخلة القيمة كل التقدير لدورك دائما وأكيد الشكر للمنظمين وأيضا بتمنى أنك تجاوب على سؤال كيف يمكن ممارسة أو على الأقل الضغط في في أروقة الأمم المتحدة في ظل فضاءات السياسة التي تتحكم فيها الآن يعني ما هي الحلول الممكن للفلسطينيين حتى بالضغط اللوبي الفلسطيني أو اللوبي العربي إنجاز التوصيف أو اللوبي الحقوقي في أمريكا في غيره كيف يمكن أن نستفيد أو نوظف هذه الأدوات باعتبار أن أيضا العدالة تتطلب قوة لحراستها وكيف يمكن صناعة هذه القوة من المدافعين عن حقوق الإنسان شكرا لك نورة مرة ثانية ورائعة كعادتك يعني في مداخل شكرا كثير Okay, um, so let's also take a question from uh, Heba, please. Can you unmute yourself? Hi, thank you, Abdel Ghani. Uh, Noura, hi. How are you? Hi, Heba. You can see me, but I'm going Hi. No, I can't see you now. Thank you so much for accepting our invitation first and taking out your precious time to speak on this crucial matter. I suppose your schedule is very bagged in this time of the year. So thank you so much on this. Uh, and thank you on this uh, great lecture that you just presented. So actually, I have two questions. One of them is US related, and the other is Palestinian related. Um, let me start with the Palestinian related one. Uh, I noticed that you address the Palestinian National Council in your book. And as you know, Palestinian Authority is to hold parliamentary and presidential elections in the upcoming months. And, and the BNC elections are also scheduled to take place in August. To what extent do you think that conducting BNC election can be realistic? And how can it serve the issue in uh, the international context? Uh, now, for my question, uh, the U.S.-related question, as Noor Arikat, as someone who worked for years in the Capitol Hill and is familiar with how things work in regard to the Palestinian-Israeli conflict, uh, what are your expectations? What expectations do you have for the uh, Biden administration? Will it be able to take a step forward or will it you know, keep it to restoring the status quo to pre-Trump era? Uh, especially with all these legal challenges that Trump had created before before leaving uh, office, you know, amendments to Terrorism Act, Taylor Force Act, just to mention a few. These are my questions, and thank you so much. Nora, you want to answer, or shall we take another question then? Uh... Um, let me answer, because Hiba asked two questions. Yes. So there's yeah, three. Go. So let me answer, okay. So I'll start by saying, no, I'm going to say everything Absolutely. I'm going to say that 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 I'm going to I, I, this is the thing. There are the UN has become a place of professionalism, right? And it's different from the UN that I studied in the 1970s, where it was. It used to be, in the words of Karman Abulsi, an excellent scholar at Oxford, who is also a Palestinian fighter, right? Um, who described it for me as a locus of battle. Where, where the delegates who entered the UN used to enter with guns on their shoulders. These were fighters. And the UN used to be a site of battle. Um, and it was at, at a moment of frankly, anti-colonial and anti-imperial war where people took up arms. And so we saw that battle happening and the US happened to be um, as powerful as it was, sidelined. What happens to the United Nations, however, 
is two things. Um, one is that the UN itself becomes, that the, the, sorry, the third world itself becomes once many of these colonized peoples achieve independence and statehood, right? They stop fighting the battle against imperialism. The original dream was to not just become independent and end colonization and become independent. The dream was to create a new economic system, a new global system. And they, they try, right? They create the new international economic order, um, but they never fulfill that dream. It is a dream yet to be realized. We have become suspended. Anti-imperialism never finished its agenda. Um, and not only do they become subsumed by debt, by you know different financing projects from the World Bank to the International Monetary Fund. Um, not only do they become despots in their own countries, we've seen that in the Arab uprisings of Arabs who have taken you know their despots to account to remove them for mostly in Egypt, in Tunisia, right, in Yemen, um, and so on and so forth, um, where they actually become the problem. And the UN is now, oh, and then the other dimension of it is when the United States realizes that it can no longer control the outcomes of the UN, it basically makes it a less significant space of advocacy for itself. So that now business continues there, but it's not as consequential as it once was, all right? And I think that all of that context is necessary to understand that the UN has become by and large an administrative um, professional space. And so what we can achieve there, you know, I think that the Palestinian, frankly, the teams, the Palestinian mission in New York and the Palestinian mission in Geneva, right, these two sites of UN advocacy are doing an exemplary job, really, given the circumstances, given, you know, the balance of power, given what's available to them, have advanced and represented the question of Palestine in the most noble ways. But what they are doing is limited by what Ramallah wants to be done. How much they can demand accountability for Israel reflects instructions from Ramallah on whether to pursue it or not. So this is not an issue for, for me to answer, well, how do you then pursue UN advocacy? It goes back to the fact that they, they are no longer fighting a liberation struggle. They are advanced, there's two branches of, I believe at least two branches of Palestinian um, liberation struggles today. One is, is a continuation of a historic liberation struggle that was articulated by the PNC as Hiba raises in 1968, in the, in the, you know, and later in the 10 point program and so on and so forth. It was a revolutionary vision. And then there's another that was planted in 1968 as well, but came to bloom in, in Oslo, which is a vision of statehood. One, one, one um, lineage of Palestinian advocacy is fighting for liberation and still conceives of ourselves as guerrillas fighting in, in for a, liber, you know, a liberation struggle. The other branch sees us as a state, a nascent state, and that we can achieve the statehood the more we act like a state. If we have a central bank, if we have a capital, if we have an airport, if we have missions all over the world, right? If we perform in diplomacy, if we arrive in suits, if we speak in this language. And, I, and that, that statehood model is frankly the official Palestinian strategy. So I, you know, people like to, to critique them by saying they're traitors, they've abandoned. No, they are pursuing a different strategic option. I happen to be in disagreement with that strategic option. Edward Said was in disagreement with that strategic option immediately. But now since Oslo has been um, 10, 20, um, some 27 years, almost 30 years of Oslo, right? 28 years of Oslo. We have seen that that strategic option is not good for us. The situation has become worse. 
And so it's empirical evidence that leads me to believe that that strategic option needs to be abandoned, or if it's pursued, it needs to be pursued as it was historically pursued, which is kind of, um, um, you know, the Vietnamese mantra of talk while you fight. We're only talking and not fighting. And so I think that that's what's necessary at the UN. We need to isolate Israel. We need to, you know, continue to 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 uh, continue to hold it to account. We need to build the coalitions that d demonstrate that it is not a legitimate state. And instead, we've been captured by the state um, strategy, which makes any of that criticism tantamount to being a bad peace partner. And we're invest and the Palestinian leadership is invested in peace. They pulled out of the negotiations with Trump, but they were waiting for Biden and immediately resumed security cooperation with Israel as soon as Biden was elected before anything was offered to the Palestinians. So I don't I don't run my mouth criticizing the PA because I'm 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 studying them like you are. I'm waiting to see what they do and how they do it different. They have resumed diplomatic relationships with the UAE and Bahrain, which have entered into normalization agreements with Israel without advancing or offering a single enduring political concession for Palestinians, not even easing the Gaza blockade. Why? Why? These are, this is not fighting. This is a, but it is strategic. And I disagree with the strategy. And I think that that strategy shapes our UN strategy as well. Um, Hiba, the PNC, what do I think about elections? So obviously what I've just set up in this frustration and you can see the my veins popping out of my neck. I'm so angry when I talk about it. It obviously represents the fact that we have a Palestinian leadership that doesn't represent most of us. Legally, it doesn't represent most of us. It represents those who can vote for it which is a truncated portion of our 10 million person population, 11 million person population across the globe. Not even the Palestinian refugees in Lebanon or in the surrounding areas, um, you know, um, Syria, and that's another, you know, issue in Jordan and Egypt can vote. Can you imagine where the diaspora is? We don't get even get to say. So I, I, I understand the desire to have an accountable leadership and that's the PNC. Few things I'll say about the PNC. Number one, yes, we definitely need an accountable and representative leadership. However, however, the PNC historically, I think we've romanticized it, okay? The PNC was never very representative of all of us. It was still a place where certain members by voting and maneuvering got to make certain decisions. So let's not overly romanticize it. Still, it's better than what we have now, right? Um, Number two, the PNC was not merely a member of elected representatives across the globe. It was comprised of um, also represented political parties. So that our failure is not our inability to elect, legitimately elect our representative. Our failure is that we don't even have robust political parties anymore. Even our political parties are stale. From Fatah, to Jabhat al Demokrati or Jabhat Shabia. I mean, these are people I respect, but they're stale. They have not cultivated new leaders. Um, and Hamas and Islamic Jihad also are legitimate political parties amongst us. Um, and, and I'm, you know, I think that they might have a better, be doing better at young leadership, but also not very much. So that our stagnation politically represents a stagnation in our political parties, in my opinion. Number three, I think that if we were to have elections, one of the way that the, you know, because um, the PLO Executive Committee has been responsive to this critique and has had elections, has representatives from North America, from Canada, from, you know, Honduras and from France and from all around the world to reconstitute the PNC. Taban, I don't, I mean, we never got, it was, they were selected, number one. There wasn't elections. They were selected and then they convened in a meeting in Ramallah where most refugees can't even travel, which is an odd decision. We're still in diaspora. So the other thing that I would say is, aside from how opportunistic and shallow that effort has been, I, I would advocate 
that we not choose our leadership based on geography, that it not be, let's choose 10 from the United States and 20 from the UK, but instead that we choose it based on ideas, political ideas. I think I, as much as I might agree with many people here, I probably disagree with them or you all when it comes to gender liberation, when it comes to economic systems, I believe in, you know, I believe in, in, in communal um, cultivation of the land and not in its private ownership, right? I don't only believe in the equality of women in the public space. I believe in a radical transformation of the concentration of power amongst men. That might put me at odds with you. And I don't want, and I would like that that my vision be represented in the new PNC rather than my geography of being in the United States being represented in the PNC so that the nationalists are represented, the radicals are represented and so on and so forth. And the Islamists are represented. And Biden, really quickly on Biden. We already know a lot. Yes, Nora. Can I continue? Sorry. Yeah, please, please, but um, let's wrap up to take another round of questions, please. Go ahead. Sorry, I apologize. Back um, Really quickly on Biden. Um, we already know a lot from Biden. Um, he's done positive things and re-entered the Human Rights Council to defend Israel there, even though Trump withdrew, reinstated the UNRWA funding of $364 million, which I think is the most important. OK, um, but also acknowledge that, that there will be the PLO mission will reopen in Washington, which doesn't matter because Congress passed a law that says once the PLO mission is in Washington, they can be sued for over 60 million dollars um, in lawsuits for the killing of Israelis. All of these are cosmetic changes on the big question, not moving the embassy back to Jerusalem. OK, Um has appointed a UN envoy that opposes BDS, has adopted the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance definition of anti-Semitism as being you know, equivalent to critiquing of Israel, has appointed a UN ambassador, um, um, sorry, a secretary of state, Anthony Blinken, who has endorsed the Abraham Accords and the normalization agreements, um, and has already criticized the ICC. Right, and we can see in the region beyond. Um, obviously, is saying we're open to renegotiating a nuclear agreement with Iran, but will not lift sanctions. Right. The one positive thing that we've seen is that they're going to um, end uh, weapons sales and intelligence transfer to Saudi Arabia in their war on Yemen. But even that is limited because it's only for offensive strikes. The point here is to say I don't have faith in the Biden administration. I, I advocated that we remove Trump because Trump was a fascist. Trump is a fascist and mobilized white supremacy and violence in the United States. Biden is a liberal, but he's still an imperialist. And so uh, I don't have hope there, but I do think that we, we, we do have more room to struggle and we should continue that struggle um, in the United States, especially. Yep. Um, all right, uh, Rawan, could you please go ahead with your question and keep the, um, uh, the comment uh, for later because we do have uh, many other questions. Thank you, Ghani. يعني بنشكر نورا جدا على الـ يعني الـ المحاضرة الرائعة والعديدة المواضيع اللي غطتها يعني صدقا زي ما حكى كمان صديقنا صلاح في البداية أنه هنالك قصور قصور في الـ الـ الفهم والتعاطي من قبل الـ السلطة الفلسطينية مع موضوع القانون الدولي كما القصور في, في اتجاهات مختلفة في عدة قضايا يعني إحنا ما عنا استراتيجية 
خارجية شاملة ولا توجهات واضحة وبنقصنا في القانون الدولي الإرادة السياسية إذا ما توافرت الإرادة السياسية لاستخدام القانون الدولي نعتقد أنه سيكون هنالك شيء مختلف لكن إذا ما بقيت كما هو الحال الآن فلا نتوقع أي جديد على يعني صعيد القانون الدولي سؤالي طالما أن المشكلة واضحة وتم تشخيصها وتأكيدها من خلال محاضرة نورا وهو أن غياب الإرادة السياسية واستخدام القانون الدولي حيث أن السلطة الفلسطينية ليست الطرف القوي لاستخدام القانون الدولي ولا ننسى أن أيضا تم وضع القانون الدولي من قبل المنتصرين سواء من خلال عصبة الأمم في البداية وهيئة الأمم المتحدة لاحقا وما تبعها من منظمات دولية وحقوقية إلى آخره إذا نحن الطرف الضعيف وتنقصنا الإرادة السياسية والقيادة الفلسطينية هي ما تتصدر الموقف لن نتحدث عن القيادة الفلسطينية وهنا سؤال لنورة لأنه لا نتوقع شيء مختلف ما هي الاستراتيجيات البديلة التي يمكن لمنظمات المجتمع المدني والأحزاب السياسية أو المنظمات الحقوقية الفلسطينية يمكن أن يعني تخطو خطوات في على صعيد القانون الدولي لتحقيق انتصارات أو لتصويب أوضاع من خلال استخدام القانون الدولي فيما يتعلق بالقضية الفلسطينية لا سيما أن هناك العديد من القضايا التي يمكن استخدام القانون الدولي بشأنها وتصويب الأوضاع فيما يتعلق بها شكرا okay. um, So shall we take now a question from um... Majd, please, can you keep it only to one question, Majd? Sorry. Um, only one question? Sorry, yeah, uh, because <laughs> you do have many well, other questions. Sorry. Yeah, I have a couple of questions, but it's okay. Uh, but like the first important, uh, the most important question is, uh, like we have mentioned Biden. So, okay, Biden done a couple of positive things, but um the capitalism is still there the imperialism is still there so my question like if we even get this close to the like what called the victory how can we uh fight the capitalism the imperialism because even if we get close to it we will like the capitalism uh will be like will still be there you know, because like even the uh, UN, like who made the UN? Every uh, imperialism, uh, imperialist country. So um, my question is, even if we get close to the victory, how can we fight the capitalism and fight it uh, to not like make a uh, make us like way back to um, to like to the zero point, you know, or worst. So yeah, and just second question, it will be short, <laughs> um, I promise. Uh, it is like uh, for Nura, uh, first of like first thing, uh, thank you for this lecture. I can't believe my eyes that uh, I'm with Nura Rikat. <laughs> So um, I just want to ask you, did you face like a threat after 2000, uh, 2006, if I'm true, uh, suits, the suits that you done in 2006? And that's it. Thank you a lot. Okay, uh, let's take uh, another question by Dr. Uh, Ramzi, please. Dr. Ramzi, the back. اوكي مساء الخير لكم جميعا مساء الخير نورا ولك ولكل الاصدقاء والصديقات بالبدايه انا عكسك انا لما تيجي الموضوع للقانون بقدرش احكي بالانجليزي بدي احكي بالعربي فاسمحي لي معلش بتفق معك بانه اللو از باور نولج از باور اند لو از بارت اوف نولج اوف كورس وحبيت كثير موضوع السيلينج يعني اتمنى انه يعني التفاؤل ونظريه التفاؤل هاي when it comes to the ICC I, I don't look 
فورت يعني بنظريه وتفاؤليه بس يعني بشكرك على مشاركه التجربه وعلى حقيقه يعني انا بعتبر نفسي مقصر واعترف بذلك باني انا ما طلعت على الكتاب لكن ما فات شيء راح اصحح خطاي هذا وساقرا بالتاكيد سؤالي هو يتعلق بالاشخاص احنا بنعرف انه بشهر 12 الماضي تم انتخاب ست قضاة للمحكمة الجنائية والاسبوع الماضي تم انتخاب بالسيد خان وحقيقة انا عملت مع الامم المتحدة لاكثر من ست سنوات واتيحت لي الفرصة لان اعمل معه في اليونيتاد في بداية العام المنصرم كمحقق بفريق الفريق الدولي اللي بقوده للتحقيق في جرائم داعش في العراق وسوريا يعني في لي تحفظات كثيرة جدا يعني على عليك شخص بس لفت نظري إنك تكلمتي بإنه هو التوب تشويس فور يونايتد ستيتس أند إسرائيل بتمنى إنك يعني تلقي مزيد من الضوء على الموضوع هذا حتى أفهم أنا يعني هل في بتصوري أنا هو شخصية نرجسية جدا و يعني مش كثير ميال لفكرة بأنه هو البست تشويس للستيتس ولا لإسرائيل شو مدى تأثير الأشخاص سواء كانوا قضاء أو المدعي العام ومكتبه على المرحلة القادمة فيما يتعلق بقضية فلسطين و هل تعتقد بانه مكتب المدى العام زي ما احنا عارفين مكتب المدى العام في الكثير من المحققين الكثير جدا من المحققين هل تعتقد بانه بالوضع الحالي بعرفش اذا بالوضع الحالي بالتمثيل اللي هلا موجود فيه والامكانيات خاصه فيما يتعلق بالمعرفه والدرايه في الواقع الفلسطيني والجرائم اللي لغايه الان تم البدء بمباشر التحقيق فيها من قبلهم هل تعتقد بانه قادر على انه يقوم بهاي الواجبات بشكل يعني بمهمه التحقيق الموكله له بموجب النظام الاساسي لروما و هل تعتقد بانه الكيان الصهيوني ما يسمى اسرائيل راح يقف عند هذا الحد بما يتعلق بالقرار اللي تم اتخاذه من البري ترايل تشامبر امبارح المحكمة الجنائية أصدرت زي نشرة شاركتها أنا مع الأخ إحسان تتعلق بعدة تساؤلات وردت حتى على لسان نتنياهو شخصيا أهمها ما يتعلق بالابيلينج وما يتعلق بالابيل وما يتعلق بال بتصريحات نتنياهو اللي تتعلق بمعاداه الساميه والمعاهدات معاهدات الصهيونيه. بتوقع اكثر واكثر من سؤال انا اسف اكثر من سؤال بتمنى بتمنى اني يعني أنا سعيد جدا بجزء المشاركة الثانية والثالثة إلي مع القانون من أجل فلسطين وبفتخر جدا بالشباب اللي بشوفهم أنا ك يعني أستاذ قانون دولي أحيانا أشعر بأنه الثقة قانون دولي جنائي طبعا أحيانا أشعر بأنه الثقة بالقانون الدولي الجنائي عند شبابنا تكاد تكون يعني مش منعدمة إذا بحكي منعدمة بجوز يعني أنا برفع من وتيرتها شوي ما في ثقة نهائيا فيما يتعلق بالقانون الدولي الجنائي عند شبابنا وخاصة الدارسين في القانون بالنسبة لأي شخص بعيش برا وبمارس القانون برا بجوز هذا الموضوع صعب شوي تفهمه لكن للأسف الشديد هذا ما نلحظه ونلمسه عدم الثقة بالمنظومة الدولية بشكل عام في شغلة مهمة أنا لا أتفق معك فيها دكتورة اللي هي أنه جماعتنا في جنيف وفي نيويورك بقوموا بواجبهم من نغ... من يعني من ممارسه عمليه انا حكيت لك اشتغلت اكثر من سبع سنين او ست سنين مع الكريمينال لو وال يعني في الدي بي في الدي بي تي او تحديدا الديبارتمنت اوف بيس كيبينج ما في تواجد ل مش بس الفلسطينيين 
العربي بشكل عام مشتتين جهدهم مشتتة فيما يتعلق بالقضية الفلسطينية والنزاع العربي مع الكيان الصهيوني مش حاضر مش حاضر في أي موضوع وبالعكس حتى لمست من بعض الإخوة العرب بيخجلوا مرات بالخوض باي نقاش يتعلق بالكيان الصهيوني بالحقوق العربيه بيخجلوا بمعنى كلمه بيخجلوا فانا نعم. بعتقد بعتقد لازم يكون في تاثير اكثر وبشجع الشباب خاصه الشباب اللي عمالي بشوف منهم ناس بيكملوا برا وحاجز اللغه بتغلبوا عليه انه ينضموا لهي المنظمه ويكون في لهم تاثير خاصه فيما يتعلق في الكريمينال لو والكريمينال جاستس سيستم في في الامم المتحده بعتذر على الايطاليه جدا انا اسف جدا شكرا وشكرا لكم تمام شكرا دكتور اول رايت ليتس ليتس نورا ام سوري كان وي هاف اونلي تو مور كويك كويستشنز اور نوت اي سي ناصر ندى ان وديع هاف كويستشنز ام هابي يو نو اي كان جيف فيري شورت انسرز اي ثينك اتس امبورتنت اولسو تو هير ذيم بيكوز اتس سو ايم اوبن Yeah. yeah, so let, let's, let's just try uh, to keep the questions very short. Uh, I'm personally not going to ask my questions, I'm being dramatic now, and I'll keep them uh, to myself or hopefully to Noura for later. So, uh, Hassan, could you please uh, go ahead with a quick uh, question? Uh, all right. Thank you, uh, Abu Ghan. Uh, my question will be very quick. Actually, I just want to express my gratitude for having the honor to uh, review your book in Arabic. Perhaps you had a copy. I think you had the link. Hassan sent you the link probably. Uh, one uh, particular detail actually uh, drew my attention about the concept manipulation that you mentioned in the book in, in different uh, places in the book. Like through the, the, by the manipulation, I mean like by through resorting to several uh, let's say methods like permissive theories to explain certain uh, terminology uh, by loosening the terms, by substituting sometimes the term, like, you know, uh, law intensity conflict or uh, armed conflict uh, short of war, uh, you know, to, to substitute it with the legally defined terms. Uh, does that count before any judge? Let's say an international judge in the ICJ or in the ICC or in local judges, uh, I mean, would they take these uh, seriously? That's it. All right. Um, one, one more question, and then we'll see if we have time for other questions. Nada, could you please go? Uh, thank you, Noura, for, for the lecture. It was very useful, actually. Uh, I benefited from it very much. Uh, one question, it's about the dilemma of justice and uh, legality, because uh, Uh, yeah, how I see it, if there are justice, like the uh, fighting and intifada, and this is like quick justice, but uh, re re resorting resorting to courts at the, you know, res resorting to courts might be uh, concerns more about the rule of law and the legality, and uh, and might. not uh, pursue justice in this case, because uh, unlike what happened in the Nuremberg uh, trials and uh, the tribunals of Yugoslavia. So I wanted to know uh, what do you think about the dilemma between legality and justice? One, one, one more thing is that, do you think that um, the ICC will deal with act of aggression or uh, genocide in the uh, in the ICC saying that you have uh, uh, reviewed the, uh, the pre-trial documentation, in the, the pre-trial investigations. Thank you. Uh, Nora, you can take now this very- I'm gonna, I'm gonna go very fast because in, in, in the last round, I gave a lecture for each response. And so now I'm gonna give you a short answer and see if we can do it. <laughs> so for the first question, it was about What are alternative strategies for the for Palestinian civil society, for the uh, human rights advocacy uh, community, um, and the political alternative political spaces in order to advance what the official Palestinian leadership hasn't done? And here, I, and what is the role of law in that? And so here, I would say that you know we face many different hurdles, including. You know, right now there's there's attacks on funding, even for agricultural cooperatives who are planting their lands in area C of the West Bank because two of their seven board members are members of the PFLP, which then NGO monitor uses 
to go to the donors to say, you are funding terrorists. I mean, this is how aggressive their advocacy is, which limits our ability to do anything. Um, and I start by saying that despite all of this, right, um, our advocacy has been relentless. The fact that now there is a BDS movement, that it's the legislation in 30 out of 50 US states, that it's being taken up by the UN as a movement, despite the fact that the PLO, the official leadership has never endorsed, B endorsed BDS. For me, that says that we as a people and our initiative have kept up the struggle of Palestine alive and have kept up the world spirit of resistance alive, even without an official leadership. And so, you know, what is my response then about what the, the alternative strategy is to continue? Now, we're all frustrated. We want to see more than popcorn advocacy all over the place and see us work as one hand. But, you know, as we saw during the Arab uprisings, we cannot anticipate when massive upheaval comes. We can only be prepared for it. As Egyptians were prepared for it, as Tunisians were prepared for it, right? And, and, and even as Palestinians have been prepared for it in, in 1936, in 1987, in 2000. And I don't, and, and then in, in 2018, in the March of Return. And I think we should have done more in response to the March of Return um, globally. But in terms of what then we do, I say we use the law as a defensive weapon to defend because even in, when the politics are against us, we can still use it as a defensive weapon, even if it's not effective for offensive strategies. Um, we can use it to create you know, political campaigns. And I think what Law for Palestine is doing is, is part of that, part of generating that energy. And I think that in terms of economic coercion and overcoming diplomatic intransigence, we continue to participate in BDS, which is different than anti-normalization. But we continue to participate um, and BDS and do the things that our leadership is not doing. How do we fight capitalism and imperialism? Uh, it's a good question. What I'll say is that it's the most difficult question. Um, it's been said that you know people can more easily, I can ask you now to imagine the end of the world and then to imagine the end of capitalism. And for you, the end of the world is probably more realistic. That has been the success of um, you know, those who defend capitalism and advance it and the success of the U.S. in leading the Cold War to make this the outcome. But how do we fight that? We fight that to, through building the alternatives. You know, part of that is building a stronger left political parties with visions. We see a split within the Democratic Party in the United States between the Democratic establishment and between the insurgency in the Democratic Party led by people like Rashida Tlaib, Elhan Omar, uh, Jamal Bowman, Bernie Sanders, Cory Bush. I mean, but the truth is that there is an insurgency who who are bringing in, you know, into popular discourse why socialism is not the antithesis of freedom. And as somebody said before, these aren't things you learn. These are things you experience. And in the U.S., we've experienced the limits of capitalism severely during the pandemic. We have the highest number of deaths, and it's become clear that if you are poor, you are more likely to die and be refused service. So these are the conditions. The fact that we don't have a system that pays us to stay at home has brought up a conversation about basic universal income. So I think that the question of how do we overcome capitalism as we fight and that we shouldn't be frustrated, but also know that you know the conditions also produce, um, the circumstances produce the conditions for fighting that make it more realistic. Um, شكراً إنك رح تقرأ الكتاب دكتور رمزي um, uh, شو uh, Institute of Palestine Studies مؤسسة الدراسات الفلسطينية um, رح يترجموا للعربي كمان فإن شاء الله الكل يقدر يقرأ So thank you um, Regarding your question about the ICC What do I know about uh, Karim Khan? Uh, these are all things that have come very quietly to the fore and from contacts that I have um, that the U.S. and Israel has, have pushed him. He was late on the scene as a candidate for the prosecutorial position, and he ended up prevailing over the Italian and Spanish nominees. Um, and and the, some of the explanation for that is his support from the U.S. and Israel. I 
can send you what I know, but it's not necessarily verifiable. It's yet to be seen, but this is what we have been told um, from people who do know. Regarding the Rome Statute, I couldn't agree with you more. Israel never became a signatory or a party to the Rome Statute, even before it was um, a defendant, a named defendant, because of Article 8 of the Rome Statute, which condemns the transfer of an occupying power civilian population into territory that it occupies. Israel used that to say that the Rome Statute was politicized, except that's verbatim, right? Um, Article 49, subsection 6 of the Fourth Geneva Convention. Um, and so even before, in 1998, Israel told us the ICC was political. So, and now that it's, you know, now that it has not acknowledged the, the jurisdiction of the court, it actually never, it didn't even submit, it didn't even respond to the question on jurisdiction, only it's Amici Curie, the friends of the court, Germany, Austria, Australia, all submitted on Israel's behalf denying Palestinian jurisdiction, I think that's, um, it tells us a lot that this is not gonna necessarily be binding, putting more emphasis on why we need to win this battle outside of the courtroom. Um, regarding the question of the manipulation just, of law. Just, just slow down a little bit huh, for our interpreters. Okay, all right. Regarding <laughs> the question on manipulation of law that Hassan, thank you for your review, Hassan. I did appreciate it very much. Um, do courts take seriously these new terms that uh, powerful states convert, like Israel's conversion of armed conflict short of war? They created a new category of war that both evades the additional protocols and evades the traditional law of war and evades the law of occupation. I mean, they created their own law. So your question, so Alec Mahallo, why would any other court take this manipulation seriously? Because, um, International law is also made of custom and customary law is comprised of state practice and opinion or juris. And if a state is a consistent objector to a law, it no longer becomes in violation of the law. It is now making a proposition for a new law. All of that to say, you know, there's a much longer conversation to have about the formation of custom, but all of that to say that, yes, other courts will take it seriously especially because it depends on what other states have done. The fact that other states have adopted Israel's interpretation in the quote unquote war on terror, and first amongst them was the United States in its drone war, um, set signals that what Israel is doing is not a violation, but is actually a proposition for a new law of war in the confrontation with irregular forces outside of the framework of the second additional protocols, Israel's argument is predicated on the denial that Palestinians represent a nascent sovereign. So unfortunately, we have, it's yet to be seen, but I think because other states have not protested it, it's more likely. If more states protest Israel's adoption, as the US did initially in 2002, before it adopted the policy, there's more likelihood. So it depends on what other states do. And that's what courts, that's what judges will pay attention to. What about the dilemma about justice and legality? So I agree, justice is manifested amongst us. It's not what the court tells us justice is. I can't emphasize that enough. I agree with that a thousand percent. Um, and in fact, the court itself will determine what the law is. It won't determine what is justice and moral. Right, and this is a, a long-standing debate between the natural law lawyers and the positive lawyers. Is the law what it is or what it ought to be? And so they often determine what it is even if it's immoral, right, and illegitimate. Um, but regarding your reference to the criminal tribunal on Ro Yugoslavia and the, tr uh, the Nuremberg trials, here I draw on Marty Koskinyemi and a number of other critical legal scholars who have demonstrated for us that these courts are more or less show trials because the world of public opinion already determined their guilt. So by the time that we actually go to trial, it's basically a way to, to, to bring the rest of the community along to achieve something socially and politically, but not necessarily to determine culpability, right? So that we already, we've already, we already know, we've already, we're in agreement. If it's contentious that we're not in agreement, there won't be a tribunal. Um, so I think I, oh, on genocide, will the ICC take up genocide? In my opinion, 
<laughs> in my strong opinion, and I hope I'm wrong, but in my strong opinion, absolutely not. I do not think the court is gonna take up the question of genocide. It's way too touchy. It won't even take up the question of aggression. I wish, I mean, I think that the blockade on Gaza is aggression more than collective punishment, right? Collective punishment means that it has the right to wage war. I don't think Israel has the right to wage war against the people it occupies. So that is aggression, but that's not even on the table. Um, the ICC will examine three questions. It's the conduct of hostilities in, in the wars on Gaza, where it will first and foremost uh, prosecute Hamas members, um, which are the easier you know, questions. And it might not ever prosecute Israeli officials for that, because if Israel shows that it can prosecute, criminally prosecute its own, then it establishes that it has national jurisdiction, which then triggers the article of complementarity, which means that the ICC can examine those questions. The issue that Israel will, that the ICC could examine because Israel will never prosecute itself is the one of settlements. Settlements is war crimes. Um, and so there, there will be no complementarity and that seems um, more or less easy. What's gonna be complicated is, you know, all the legal questions. Well, what jurisdiction is established by Oslo? Are these settlements or are these neighborhoods as Oslo called them? Oslo <laughs> describes the settlements in Jerusalem as Jewish neighborhoods. So, you know, the things that we think are black and white are going to be significantly um, compromised and complicated by a number, you know, all these other layers, all these other layers. So, you know, it's the question of, well, are they neighborhoods or are they settlements? Has this been established? How many states have recognized? And so on and so forth. Did Palestinians sell this land? Were they compensated? It won't just be the things that we know to be true because it'll be refracted through the language of law, which is a very obscuring language. As, as, as the woman who asked me about law, I think it was Neda, about law versus um, justice versus legality. You know, it's something that I actually say in the book that freedom has two meanings, okay? Um, in, in, in the law, freedom for people equates to, um, or, you know, equ or, sorry, self-determination has two meanings. In the law, self-determination refers to some sort of national independence and statehood in the law. But in practice, freedom transcends that. It's much more than just having a state. It's the difference between love, okay, and marriage. Marriage is a legal institution. It's a contract that the state recognizes and then offers you benefits and duties and privileges, right? But it doesn't mean if you're married, you're in love. So it's the same way of thinking about when we think about the distinction between, you know, legality and justice, it's that same conflict. Just because it might be in the law doesn't mean it's just and vice versa. Yeah, thank you, Nora. Um... Well, let's end it. Uh, actually, I'm very happy that the book is going to be translated into Arabic. And I think it's a very good note to end the discussion with because uh, I think, uh, and, and one of the questions I had, I'm not going to ask my questions, were about, uh, were about this issue, the fact that uh, Noura wanted to speak in English. I think many of us too would want to speak in English whenever we want to discuss international law. Uh, so it's not about Noura being Palestinian American, but even you know Palestinians who have been born and raised in Palestine, or Egyptians, or I don't know Tunisians, or people from uh, all over the Arab world uh, would prefer to speak in uh, in English when it comes to international law or in French. I think this is one of the biggest uh, problems, and I think amongst the many uh, messages Noura is trying to uh, uh, send. Uh, through her book is that basically Arabs and Palestinians need to start using the language of international law, start understanding that international law is unavoidable, even if we don't like it or we don't like some aspects of it. It's unavoidable and we have to instrumentalize it uh, strategically to serve our political uh, project. And, and one, of, one of, uh, of, of, of the manifestations of this project is that uh, we would we should start using international law and using the language of international law. So uh, having this book translated 
would be would be great. And I think this is one of the most important missions also of Law for Palestine. It is about that. It's about um, disseminating the language of international law, the language of uh, also critical international law, the language of structural bias, the language of uh, of the I don't know the constructivist uh, critique of uh, international <laughs> law, etc., which are very hard terms to translate into Arabic uh, for now. لو قلتم ما بعرفهم. I have I have no idea how to say, you know, the constructivist understanding of international law in in Arabic. So so I think it is amazing that your book would be translated. I think if I read it in Arabic, I will understand how to say constructivism in Arabic. Uh, uh, and also critical legal studies or whatever. So yeah, so yeah. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Uh, on a on a related note to our interpreters, uh, we did uh, Hassan and Hassan Amran. I have no idea how they could translate everything. Uh, so thank you very much. Yeah, and thank you very much, Nora, and to uh, Law for Palestine and Hassan. Uh, yeah, thank you. شكراً يعطيكم العافية. Thank you, thank you so much. شكراً نورا. شكراً عبد الغني. شكراً للجميع. شكراً نورا. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you.